Hey guys, in this video, I'm gonna be going over tube feeds. I feel like this is an important topic for hospitalists and uh, residents to know, but it's not one that we necessarily receive a lot of education on. And disclaimer, I'm not a dietitian, obviously, and most of this is just research on my own, but I felt like multiple times throughout residency, I've wanted to know a little bit more about how we start the process of tube feeds, what the benefits are, and you know how we choose different formulas and stuff. And so I thought I'd make this video today for you guys. So tube feeds, um, the number one question that I think most of us are going to have uh, in the hospital is how do we start the process of tube feeds? So the first thing I'm going to recommend right off the bat is this um, website called ClinCalc. And it's a website that one of my co-residents had linked to me that they had been shown by a nutritionist. But it's this meta this website called clincalc.com nutrition slash enroll nutrition. And here you basically put in the patient's weight and their height and automatically it's going to calculate what their caloric needs are going to be and how to advance the person's tube feeds, like what their goal rate is going to be and how quickly you should advance it. So for example, if we say we have a 72 inch male who is 85 kilograms, no fluid restriction, uh, and then we choose a, a particular formula, for example, let's say let's choose isosource, then it is going to tell us the goal for his uh, tube feedings is going to be 75 cc's an hour, start at 20 cc's an hour, titrate by 10 to 20 milliliters an hour every four hours to goal, and then give 250 milliliter free water flushes every four hours, as well as giving some additional protein supplement as well. And this is perfect because this is exactly what you put into that epic order, um, you know, telling the nurses how quickly to advance the tube feeds. And this is a really nice thing because I remember frequently as a resident, I'd basically just be putting everybody on trickle tube feeds. Even if there was no reason to not advance it, I would just be like, okay, 10 cc's an hour of some random formula that I choose, and uh, then we'll consult a dietitian, and hopefully they like see the patient within the next day and can start advancing it then. But there's so many hours of missed tube feeds that you could be having for your patient, and so I feel like it's really beneficial to use something like this ClinCalc calculator to uh, really start ramping up that patient's nutrition as quickly as possible. All right, so how to start tube feeds? The answer is gonna be using that ClinCalc calculator. But the number two question is, you know, how to choose a formula? So as you can see in here, I mean, how did I choose isosource? Or how do I choose between Glucerna, Ingevity, Nutrin, Osmolite, Peptamin, all of these different things? So this requires a little bit of looking into the different formulas to really understand the differences between them. And based on basically my uh, research and reading on this, uh, there's basically a couple different types of formula. So first, you're going to have your standard formulas. This is going to include things like isosource, Jevity, Nutrin, and Osmolite. And then you have what are called pre-digested formulas. This would be like Peptamin and Vivonex. You have a disease-specific formulas for people who have, for example, CKD or diabetes. So that would be your Glucerna, Diabetosource, and Nepro for uh, CKD patients or ESRD patients. And then finally, you're gonna have uh, these blenderized uh, formulas, which I'll talk about in just a second. So I'd say at least like 90% of the time, you're gonna wanna use or stick with these standard formulas. Uh, the pre-digested ones are basically formulas that come with some enzymes and kind of have already broken down some of the nutrients to make it a little bit easier for the body to kind of process. But there hasn't really been that much evidence that these pre-digested formulas are actually clinically beneficial for the patient. And rather, it's just like a much increased cost or um, you know expense for the patient. The disease-specific ones are obviously um, pretty easy to use. So if your patient has diabetes, you're really going to want to use Glucerna or Diabetosaurus. And then if they have ESRD, you want to think about Nepro, but um, from what I've read, you really only need to use Nepro if you actually have electrolyte abnormalities, like hyperkalemia, for example. If the patient's electrolytes are completely normal, you can just stick directly with the standard formula and be completely fine. And then finally, just to touch on the blenderized formulas, these are ones where they're made with like whole foods, so it's supposed to be a little bit more natural than these kind of laboratory-made ones. Um, and it's like ground up seaweed and chicken and tuna and like just like blenderized. And this is like, you know, probably a good thing for patients, but most patients are probably not going to be on these formulas because they are very, very prohibitively expensive compared to the standard formulas. In terms of choosing between the different standard formulas, um, you know, isosource is really going to have kind of extra protein. Uh, which can be very beneficial for patients. Jevity is really known for extra fiber. And, you know, all of these come with different, like, fiber formulations that you can find. Um, Nutrin, again, is going to be extra protein. 
And then osmolite is like a low calorie extra protein also. In terms of what I've seen at my institution is that you really seem to stick kind of with the isosource and neutrin as kind of first lines. Um, and then if a patient is having a lot of severe diarrhea or difficulty tolerating the other formulas, then you may want to find a different formula with extra fiber, for example, so the Jevity. The other thing to note is uh, all of these formulations also have energy dense formulations. So for example, you may see instead of Nutrin 1.0, you have Nutrin 1.5 and Nutrin 2.0. And these can be beneficial if your patients uh, have, for, some, for example, some kind of fluid restriction and you want to give them a much more concentrated amount of um, feeds. So that would be a good option. But these ones haven't really shown to be much more beneficial than the standard 1.0 formulas from what I've read. And they also may cause more diarrhea because they're, they have a higher osmolality. So they're going to stimulate more secretion in the gut and can lead to more diarrhea. So just to show you what I'm talking about, so you can see there's Jevity 1, Jevity 1.2, and Jevity 1.5. These are all going to be more concentrated versions. And you got Nutrin 1, Nutrin 1.5, Nutrin 2, and uh, the Nutrin 1 fiber. So you have all of these different kinds of um, formulations. One good way to really look into the differences, if you're actually very interested, is uh, you can go to Aspen, um, this nutritioncare.org um, website, and you can actually look at all of the standard volume um, formulations, the concentrated volume, and hydrolyzed, that's the ones, uh, you know, will have pre-digestive enzymes. And uh, one thing I like to do is actually just really click on them. So I could compare, you know, uh, Nutrin 1.0 with Jevity 1.0, and you can go through the nutrition facts for all of them. And you'll see that Nutrin 1.0 doesn't have any fiber in it, and it's got 10 grams of protein. And then the Jevity 1.0 has 10.5 grams of protein, and it's got 3.4 grams of dietary fiber. So that's basically my simple approach to choosing a formula. If you're not really sure, probably just start with isosource or Nutrin and just kind of up titrate it. And then if they're starting to have symptoms, then you would choose one with fiber. So talking about fiber really quickly, it can help decrease diarrhea. It can improve tolerance. The things are though, is that in patients who are hemodynamically unstable, for example, any critically ill patients, you really want to avoid this because it can can lead to uh, increased mesenteric ischemia uh, because basically it's just requiring more blood flow to the uh, bowels. So do not give in critically ill patients. And so point number four is going to be, are there really any contraindications to doing tube feeds? And uh, I also wanted to just address some common questions that people have about tube feeds in general. So one of the most common situations that you may want to decrease or hold tube feeds is going to be in ICU patients who are on pressors. So this is one situation where it's thought that the tube feeds may be, um, again, increasing blood flow to the uh, bowels and the splanchnic circulation when you don't actually have that capacity to provide that blood flow there. And so you can lead to bowel ischemia. Now, if you look at some of these uh, studies, you'll find that uh, really um, enteral nutrition should be given to patients on low dose vasopressors. There's a lot of studies on this. And actually, Actually giving internal nutrition to patients early on in their ICU course actually improves uh, mortality. Here you can see that this study compared outcomes between early enteral nutrition and late enteral nutrition in ventilated patients with shock requiring low, less than one microgram per kilogram per minute, medium 0 0.1 to 0 0.3, or high dose norepinephrine. And you can see that the 28-day mortality rate was significantly lower in the early internal nutrition versus the uh, late internal nutrition group in the low-dose and medium-dose norepinephrine group. In the high-dose norepinephrine group, there was no difference. So this study basically showed that if their uh, presser use uh, is less than 0.3 micrograms per kilogram per minute of norepinephrine, there's probably some mortality benefit to continuing them on uh, early internal nutrition. In practice, however, what I've really seen is that in patients going about over 0.1 uh, of norepinephrine is when people start to get a little bit hesitant about giving full uh, enteral nutrition. And uh, at that point, they usually start to slow the rate down, maybe come down to trickle or what are what is known as trophic tube feeds. And uh, you can see that this is kind of uh, echoed in this paper paper where they saw that specifically at norepinephrine doses less than 12.5, this was associated with uh, enteral nutrition tolerance. 
Another study that they looked at showed that early enteral nutrition may be tolerated and safely administered in patients with septic shock who are adequately fluid resuscitated and at less than 0.14 milligrams per kilogram per minute of norepinephrine. So that's kind of what, based on my study, uh, would be the threshold for when you should be like, okay, maybe let's just drop the rate a little bit. However, I do want to say if somebody is at a low dose of norepinephrine, you don't have to just automatically switch them to a trickle tube feeds. You can actually continue to advance them to their goal rate and only really come off of it if they're starting to have signs of intolerance or you know they're aspirating a lot with it or they're having a rising lactate that's unexplained those are all indications that you should probably pull back a little bit on the uh, enteral nutrition side of things so here i'm just going to write early enteral nutrition is beneficial probably if they are less than 0.15 of uh, norepinephrine you can probably continue and also, I do want to you know, point out one of the main benefits for giving at least trickle or trophic tube feeds is that it actually protects the bowel mucosa and the gastric lining of the stomach as well. So once you start trickle tube feeds, you actually can stop GI prophylaxis or stress ulcer prophylaxis. So um, trophic or trickle tube feeds reduce the risk of stress ulcers. And this is definitely an important note that you should know because this is one of the main reasons that we really favor getting early nutrition in our patients in the ICU. Another common question is, should we t check uh, gastric residual volumes? So this is basically uh, when you have the nurse you know, give some tube feeds and then slightly afterwards, um, they're going to check to see how much residual volume of the tube feeds is just like sitting in the stomach. And this is something that was routinely done in the past where this would be a sign of if somebody's tolerating uh, tube feeds or not. You know, the goal was to keep their gastric res residual volumes less than 500 milliliters um, whenever it was checked. Uh, but now the 2016 Aspen uh, guidelines have actually uh, suggested that no routine um, assessment of gastric residual volumes is, is recommended. And so really, we should not routinely be checking this. This is great because um, we really should be going off clinically if the patient is tolerating the uh, tube feeds or not. You know, like, are they aspirating? a lot? Are they like, are they actually having signs of discomfort from this? Uh, or, the, you know, the rising lactic acid that I talked about. And this really reduces the uh, nursing burden uh, of having to check all these gastric residuals all the time. And furthermore, it stops, uh, you know, unnecessary interruptions in diet and nutrition that these patients would otherwise be getting because you know in the past if the gastric residuals were high we would just stop the tube feeds or slow them down significantly when there was really no indication or need to do that so uh, do not routinely check gastric residual volumes is the current recommendation uh, a couple other ones to note um, so uh, post pyloric feeding tubes uh, are these associated with decreased risk of aspiration um, to be honest, the evidence for this is not very strong, at least from what I know, but it is still something that is routinely done. So, I mean, if, if you have the stomach here, right, and that's my example of a stomach, and then you have the pylorus right here. So you can have an NG tube that just comes into the stomach and then it's putting in the tube feeds here and there's a higher, thought to be a higher risk of aspiration uh, because it's in the stomach. But then if you placed a post pyloric uh, feeding tube that goes into the duodenum, for example, a Dobhoff tube, then, uh, you know, maybe there's going to be less aspiration because it has to reflux through the pylorus and then back up the lower esophageal sphincter. So there should be theoretically lower risk of aspiration. Um, in reality, we haven't really seen this, at least not strong evidence for it. And um, but it's still a routine practice that a lot of people will do to try and reduce the um, risk of aspiration. So I would say just kind of based on your clinical judgment, whether you think this might be beneficial for the patient or not. Another quick one is what if the patient is paralyzed? So you're doing neuromuscular blockade for their uh, ARDS, for example, then uh, can you give tube feeds? Uh, yes, you can still give tube feeds. That's because the paralysis uh, really works on the skeletal muscle and uh, things like that, whereas our digestive system is using smooth muscle, and so that's not paralyzed. They'll still be able to digest things uh, just fine. All right, and then finally, I just want to touch briefly on kind of getting the patient set up for outpatient uh, tube feedings, so uh, something they're going to be continuing long-term. And so uh, point number five is really going to be long-term methods of tube feeding. So, um, you know, first of all, you've got continuous tube feeds. This is what you're often going to be doing in the hospital, especially in the ICU setting. You know, it's going at a lower rate, um, so like 20 milliliters an hour when you start off, for example, and so it's more tolerable for the patients. But, you know, this is a little bit more uh, difficult to do outside, and it also doesn't mimic our natural uh, feeding, you know, 
cycle that, you know, we normally have a bolus of food come in and then we digest that and then we have another bolus of food come in. So it's not the ideal method, but it is something that we commonly use in the hospital. The next uh, kind of method is a cyclic feeding. So for example, anywhere from eight to 24 hours um, in, in duration. And oftentimes, uh, patients will have a nocturnal feeding. Uh, for example, you know, just attach yourself to the tube feed while you're going to sleep and just allow your food to be digested while you're there because you're hooked up to this uh, pump and this in this pole. So it's best to do while you're sleeping. Um, so this has the advantage of, you know, during the daytime, the patient will be free to walk around. So they're going to be fully mobile. Uh, but the downside is compared to continuous, obviously, um, because there's a short, shorter duration of tube feeding going on, uh, the rates are going to be have, are going to be higher. So it may be a little bit more difficult for patients to tolerate. Uh, after that, you've got intermittent tube feeds, uh, which kind of falls into uh, also the category of bolus tube feeds. And bolus tube feeds are really what you're going to want to uh, get your patients on because it's the most physiologic, as I had mentioned earlier. So we'll write bolus here. So again, really try to get your patients onto bolus tube feeding because again, you're gonna have that mobility. Uh, you're also mimicking a normal feeding cycle. And uh, just to show you kind of how that process is, um, you know, patients with bolus tube feeds don't actually need to go home with like an infusion pump. Uh, they can really just do this by themselves very easily, either with this gravity method where they just uh, literally just pour like a can of tube feeds into the syringe and it just by gravity goes into their stomach um, or they can do the syringe method where they just push in um, you know feeds whenever needed so this is definitely the optimal tube feeding regimen that you want to get your uh, patients on and i think it's important to understand um, you know how the patients will be doing this at home because uh, you know you, you need to figure out what equipment they need when they leave the hospital are they going to need an infusion pump or are they just going to need some syringes and some of the tube feeding um, bags so that they can just you know load up their own syringe and just administer it to themselves. Uh, again, before all patients leave the hospital, make sure they have tube feeding education so they know how to properly do all of this stuff, how to properly take care of it and make sure it doesn't get infected or anything. Um, but that's basically it. That's, that's pretty much the basics. So again, I hope this video was helpful in terms of A, figuring out how to choose a formula and then how to figure out or calculate uh, what rate to give the tube feeds at and how to advance that. And then also letting you know about, uh, you know, the utility of fiber, uh, if, you know, this is beneficial in ICU patients and when we have to stop using them for increasing pressure requirements, and then also different kinds of tube feeding methods once patients are discharged from the hospital. Thanks for watching this video. Let me know down in the comments if you have any questions or anything else that you'd like to learn about. Subscribe if you enjoyed this content, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.